Okay, so <coughs> what we're doing today is we're looking at the response of the early Christians to the power of God in the Gospel. Not just that. We're looking at the response of the early Christians to the power of God in the Gospel and the persecution they faced for being part of the people of God. Consistently so. Now you can be a Christian but not be consistently part of the people of God. And the response you'll get from the world around you is then different from the one that you'll get if you are seeking to live consistently with what you believe and so on. We're looking today then at the response of the early Christians to the gospel of God, to the power of God in the gospel, and the persecution they faced for being consistently part of the people of God, consistently living with that gospel, permeating their being. It wasn't the way to court favour. It wasn't the way to court popularity to follow Christ. It wasn't in those days and it isn't in these. I have more than an inkling that our society is taking us now to a place very similar to the one that we see Philip in and those early believers in Jerusalem. Wales hasn't always been as Christianised as this. I fear she is reverting to type. So this becomes important to us. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They were scattered, and their response, <laughs> funnily enough, was more. Mm. Was to preach the word wherever they went. Here's the situation Stephen was a great guy. He was a man full of God's grace, and the power of God was with him. And he'd been made uh, elected by the Greek speaking people in the church in Jerusalem to be an elder. You remember that situation in Acts chapter 6. But opposition arises for Stephen and the other believers from the synagogue of the freed men. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. And these men began to argue with Stephen, but they couldn't stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Trouble broke out. He was hauled before the Sanhedrin, ultimately taken out and stoned, praying for his persecutors as he entered glory. Stephen, a man full of God's grace, a man full of God's power, you'd expect things to go well for him, but that is not the way it works. That is not what happens next. That is not the story, and it never is. A man full of God's grace we want to be. A man full of God's power we want to be. But a man therefore subject to the opposition of the godless religious. From the synagogue of the freedmen, upwardly mobile, aspirational, and unfriendly people. Notice in red the hometown of Saul, Tarsus, is in Cilicia. And he's going to be heavily involved in this story because it's at his feet that the garments of the people stoning Stephen are laid. Notice in yellow the source of their hostility. They could not stand up against his wisdom. He was telling them the truth. It was obviously so. And they didn't like it. People don't, you know. Nor the spirit by whom he spoke. They don't like that either. Well, this incident led to the first recorded martyrdom in the Bible, in the New Testament. Instituted and so much led, so it appears, by that very same Saul of Tarsus from Cilicia, at whose feet the garments were laid. Some people, who, people like Derek, who looked into Palestinian culture, Jewish culture around the first century, will tell you that the person who organised the stoning, took care of the clothes. And there's Paul, Saul of Tarsus, the coat at his feet. And Saul went off persecuting the church. This stoning of Stephen is just the start of it. Saul went off persecuting and the church was scattered with just the apostles left leading the church at Jerusalem. But look how those scattered people then behaved. On that day, Acts 8, 1 to 3, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. 
Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. And it kicks off a wave of intentional evangelism. Now, intentional evangelism is the phrase that's going to come up, okay? It's going to keep coming up for a bit. We mean it. We mean to do it. This is deliberate. We're not just out there as Christians being nice, making friends, being popular. We have a message that we wish to convey, please, if you have a moment to listen. Those people scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now please notice their focus is on the message. The focus is not on attracting a crowd through fine sounding words. Twittering pastors, please not. I've heard again over the Christmas period where pastors have always had too much time on their hands after Christmas. The most appalling load of twaddles, fine sounding and correct sounding twaddle being poured out. The stuff, sort of stuff that says, you know, preach the gospel at all times if necessary, use words. That's like saying, please could you tell me your phone number, I don't want to use any numbers. The message is not on attracting a crowd through fine sounding words, not on getting a following. The focus is not on identifying with people in the sense that means ingratiating ourselves with them. Rather identifying with them in the way that tells the truth, that hurts in a way they can't miss. The focus is on identifying with people enough so they can hear the message they don't get. And just about enough of that, no more. The key thing is not pleasant conversations. It's lasting conversions. They went around, preaching the word wherever they went. What did they say? What did they say? See, this is confusing, and, and books get written about it. The answer at first might sound tolerably vague, but, but it's deliberate. They preached the word. Okay, so get an idea with this. There were people who'd been diasporized, Hymen un diasporentis, those who had been spread, scattered, you know, in response to the persecution, they'd been scattered, they'd thrown into the diaspora. The Aelso, they went about. Evangelizing with the word. They were dispossessed, they were dislocated, they were uprooted, and they were put onto the move. So here's what they did in their trouble, their dispossession, their alienation from the things and the comforts of this world that are legitimate, but that have been removed from them violently and unjustly. Here's what they did as the response to the injustice of it all. The response to unfairness and injustice in hard times was to go about preaching the word. It's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? Look shocked, that's it. <laughs> it's a shocker. The response to hard times, you won't get it to. Bar Hans and Gingrich in the Greek English text can tell us this is about announcing and proclaiming the good news of the gospel message. Slightly like vague. Dictionary Testament theology shows Luke Acts loves this verb, uses it for telling the gospel, telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection, telling people. The central stuff of the Christian faith. It's a big, inclusive old word so far as content is concerned, but it's clearly about telling particular people what they need to hear and what they need to know to be able to turn and trust in Jesus. Lauer Neider's Greek English lexicon of the New Testament based on semantic domains. It's quite a title for a book, isn't it? It's quite a book. To communicate good news about something, to tell the good news, to announce the gospel. It's telling them something they don't know, and they'll have to listen to and take on board if they're going to get it. It is not making friends, although friends are made for the gospel. It is not Christianized social services, although good news and good things are brought to the poor by the wayside. It is intentionally telling them what they need to know to get right with God through Jesus. And what they really need to know is so broad. It varies so much. So they go about, pre you know, preaching the word. Preaching is the wrong English word to be using all the time here. I want you to realise that. This is not preaching. This is communicating the gospel. But I can't think of a better word at the moment, because evangelising sounds even worse. It sounds like something you wouldn't do to a dog, doesn't it? 
evangelize it. Mm. Of the RSPCA. They're telling the word. Now look, there are five recorded sermons of Peter in Acts where it tells us what some of the stuff he says. A lot of the sermons in Acts, they don't tell you what they said. Just annoying in a funny kind of way, because you'd love to know, be curious. But those five sermons of Peter are so varied according to the situation, the context, the people he's talking to, and so on. What is the content of the gospel? It's all sorts of things in Peter's preaching. What's the coming of the gospel in Paul's preaching? Well, there's seven, I think, recorded sermons of Paul. In the <coughs> where he, you know, they tell us roughly what he was preaching about. And again, they vary so much. Can't we see that? But what they always preached, the exclusive subject matter for deliberate New Testament evangelism, is always the Word. It's always the Word. The variation arises because they're seeking appropriateness to, amongst other things, the people they're looking at at the moment they're speaking. And what those people need to know to turn and trust in Christ. Right? But what they always preached was what this verse describes as the word. We may have had great conversations, answered deep searching questions, but very warm relationships, but we really don't know it without the word. And those scattered and those wrong-footed, persecuted people went everywhere announcing God's word, his view, neither ours nor the people we're speaking to. Him speaking, seeking to put our poor selves to the rear, seeking for his dynamic, actually then in the moment, voice to be heard, not his theoretical historical voice, but his voice to be heard now through the word that's being preached, which is his word. Not in my strength or through love, well, well, it has to use my lungs and breath, but dependent on him, speaking through his word, breathing life into valleys full of dead bones. So they stand up and live. They went around, communicating the word. And it is that that is the stock in trade of faith. That is what Christians do. Somebody helpfully tw twittered today, I think I saw it, early this morning, a quote from J.C. Ryle saying anybody who takes their Christian faith seriously is going to be concerned for the lost souls of men and women. That's the stock in trade of faith. But what you're actually going to tell each group varies. So they went around preaching the word. See, God wants the gospel shoot to fit. I'm thinking of Cinderella and the sisters here. Right? It's going to fit appropriately. That's what it's going on. Um, what am I doing that? Okay, let me put it like this. I object to the four spiritual laws, okay? I've got biblical reason to object to the four spiritual laws. Now it helps for us to know where we're going, to know what the gospel is, and to have hooks on which to hang our chats with people. But if you work your way through Acts, through the recorded sermons of Paul and of Peter, to some extent of the less prominent characters like Stephen or Philip, what you spot immediately is the variety of ways they express the same gospel message in their preaching different from one another, and different according to who they're talking to at the time, to bring them all to the same point of following Christ. Some people will need to be shown how the act of power they've just seen relates to the Gospel. Some will need to be shown how the Gospel relates to the historical teaching of the Old Testament. Some will need to be reasoned with on the basis of their philosophy and poetry to bring them to consider what is in God's Word. There's huge variety. And of course each preacher will be expressing it all differently too because they're all different people from different backgrounds. Peter didn't have the same sort of early life as Paul. Not by a long way. He even spoke differently. And there's variety as different sins and situations are addressed as well. And this is, as the truth is applied to a variety of of kinds of people and cultures, but the content we all preach is the word. And evangelism hasn't happened, and the gospel hasn't gone forward if we're not communicating the word. In all its variety, in all its teaching about which is the way that we need to walk in. See, Jesus came saying, Follow me. That was his initiating point. That was what he's trying to do. And as we speak with people about the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to get them from where they are to following him. We need an instance of the priority of God's word and the way we do our evangelism. We're looking at it right in this verse here in Acts 8 4. 
but it's all aimed at a particular context. So now we're in that dull period between Christmas and New Year, we're all really, really tired, so let me give you an illustration. <coughs> I sound like I've been on Twitter too much this week, and I haven't, really, I haven't. But um, there was quite a Twitter response to the Queen's speech. Did you hear the Queen's speech? Queen's Christmas address to the Commonwealth? Did you hear that? Two separate guys, one who used to be a minister and one who currently is uh, in a, well, he used to be a minister and is now leading a Christian network complex with her. She quoted a carol, if I were a shepherd I'd bring a lamb, if I were a wise man I'd do my part, what can I give him? Give him my heart. Try that was pretty straight, well done your match. That's direct madam, you yeah. know. One of these guys said, Do you as a minister of the gospel exhort dead sinners to give their hearts to Jesus or to repent and believe the gospel? What I'm saying is that the phrase give your heart is unclear and open to interpretation. Preach Christ clearly. Where does scripture say give your heart to Jesus? It says repent and believe the gospel. Now my initial thought is, what does repentance mean? Just take your heart and wean it from living for yourself. And give it to Christ to following him no nope, you've got to say these words well that didn't happen in the Bible chum did it and then another one a, a guy a guy is much more <laughs> well thought out as well going to go out on a limb and say I don't think Queen's speech was that great Jesus was there for sure but not much gospel not much gospel so you wouldn't say that to give him my heart involves stopping living for myself and giving my life over to Christ, entrusting myself to him, getting off my way into his way, giving him my heart. What is repentance? I wouldn't using a word like repent to her audience confuse, not clarify what's meant, because people think they know what it means and they don't. See, there are a lot of different ways to say the same thing. And frankly, asking the titular head of the state church to express herself in precisely the terms Peter used in Acts 2.38 on the day of Pentecost is probably a bit much even for me. Variety and appropriateness, the two must go together. Appropriateness to the context. And involved in that context, I mean appropriateness to the preacher, appropriateness to the hearer, appropriateness to the message itself. See, preaching isn't acting. Acting is assuming a persona other than your own or appearing to do so in order to tell an audience a story. But preaching is for real, it's for me. I'm telling you what I know from God's word here. It's got me in it. A long, long time ago, a guy called Phillips Brooks wrote a book on preaching. It's an old, old book. And he, he described preaching as truth expressed through personality. <coughs> through personality, I thought I was a bit. No, but actually, that's what integrity is about. So far as ever I can manage it, it's a matter of personal integrity, so it's always a battle. What you see here is what you get. And when Peter stood up to preach the word, he was a fisherman preaching the word. When Paul got up to preach the word, he was a scribe preaching the word. And you can tell by the way they do it through the book of Acts. Now Peter stood up to preach and the leaders of the Jews objected to him profoundly as in Acts 4. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, Rulers and elders of the people have been called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple. Know this, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, this man stands before you healed. And he talks about sons that builders have rejected. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. Woo! That's telling them for a fisherman. <laughs> and it says in Acts 4.13 When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised they were unschooled ordinary men they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And the impact on that unbelieving audience is far greater for the fact that it's not Paul the scribe doing that, but it's Peter, the fisherman. And he sounds like a fisherman from Tuk North in Galilee. There's an integrity problem with the message if it isn't handled appropriate to the preacher. Of course, there's going to be a communication failure if it isn't handled in a manner appropriate to the audience, to the hearers. 
So both Peter and Paul clearly, they vary their subject matter in Acts for the pagans and the synagogue people, for example. Very different sermons. Lystra and Derby, or in Iconium in the synagogue. Very different. To a little bit later than that sometime, perhaps. Appropriate to the preacher, appropriate to the audience, and appropriate to the message itself. Because absolutely crucially, the context we're speaking in is one where God has spoken. God has given us his word. There's going to be integrity, communication, and truth problem if the message isn't communicated in a manner appropriate to the message itself. For we, says Paul, have renounced secret and shameful ways. We'll give you what's there. Now this is a big problem for Christians. You know, it's, it's so common, isn't it, to see an evangelistic event. And actually what you've got is what the advertising or the sales people call bait and switch. Right? You know about bait and switch. If you invite people for a barbecue, they get a barbecue, not a Bible study with sausages. Right? Does that make sense? Why is that? Because we try to act with integrity. We try to act in a manner that tells what the gospel is actually like. The gospel isn't a bait and switch, is it? Okay, the situation they were in and the message they brought then seemed to, uh, to me to be instructive for us. They preached the word. And it was the Bible as it bears on the situation of the person you're dealing with. So, for example, if I'm dealing with a father who's struggling with teenage kids, I teach him the way of Jesus for a father with teenage kids. Does that make sense to you? Because for him, getting off the track he's on and onto the right track, repenting and turning to Christ is going to involve learning what a father with troublesome teenage kids needs to be like and getting to be like that himself. Changing time. If I'm dealing with a, a harassed person, a harassed young mother, there we are, there's a little analogy. If I'm dealing with a harassed young mother, what, what I want to be communicating is the way of God, how to follow Christ as a harassed young mother. In the hope they'll get off the godless way of dealing with it and onto the godly way of dealing with it and walk with Jesus. Does that make sense? Now there's repentance and faith involved there. But we're teaching the way in which we should walk. We're teaching the truth of God and we're asking people to come in on it and walk with Jesus. Don't get the idea I'm saying it's not important to call for repentance and faith. Crucial. Absolutely must be done. Gotta happen. But here's what it looks like for you, the context, your situation. And here's how I'm going to describe it to you because I'm this sort of preacher and it's consistent with the message and it's consistent with you and your situation. They went everywhere preaching the word, and that's the sort of way they were doing it. And that accounts for the variety in all their preaching and all their sermons. Now, we're then given two worked examples of that with Philip. Two worked examples of how that works out. And I could beat on now and describe all that for you. You don't look like you're up for that. <laughs> you're looking really as tired as I feel. And he thinks he needs to go on and do. Philip goes off into a city in Samaria and he preaches the word there. It has a particular shape and character and form. Have a look at it in Acts 8. Then the Spirit of God comes along and picks up Philip and takes him somewhere else. And Philip is open for that because it's the word of God, the living God, that he's there serving. And if God says, I want my word there then, and this is how, then that's what happens, because he's working with a living God who speaks in his word. And off he goes to the desert road. And by the desert road he meets a guy in a chariot, and he's an African guy, he's a high-ranking official, and he doesn't hold back because of any of that. He doesn't hold back because the guy's from a different culture, he doesn't hold back because the guy is important. He runs up alongside the chariot. It would be much more impressive to drive up alongside the BMW chariot, wouldn't it? But he hasn't got one. So, <coughs> so as a poor guy, he sort of runs along and takes away. Hello? And the guy's reading the Bible. Can you understand what you're reading? Well, for heaven's sake, stop and let me on board. He didn't quite say that either. He asks open questions. Can you understand? And the guy says, How can I understand unless somebody explains it to me? Stop the chariot. Get up here. Do you know about this? Yeah, I know about this. Philip speaks of them about his own experience of God and the ways of God and what it is that Isaiah was talking about. He's talking about Jesus dying on the cross. And funny enough, that guy, that, that Ethiopian, turns to him and he says, Man, alive. look, there's water. Why can't I get baptized now? 
you can imagine Philip has been being terribly vague and respecting the man and his position in society. He hasn't even been saying, look, here's the score. Jesus died on the cross, he died for your sins, put you right with God, you need to repent and be baptised, chum. And the guy says, well, that's water. Why not? And Philip says, get your kit off, we're going in. They went everywhere preaching the word, bearing it to the people they met, but looking for a result. Definitely looking for a result. What can we learn for our intentional evangelism from the passage we've been looking at today? Whatever their troubles, circumstances and privations, and these people were in hard times that we're looking at here, and Philip was one of them. They were in hard times. But in hard times, early Christians announced the word of God wherever it was that they went. They were intentional about it. Now I know it's an embarrassment to my children and perhaps to my family that wherever I go I'm chatting to people. But I work on the basis, if you're not chatting to them, you're never going to chat to them about Jesus, are you? Be chatty. We're all different. We've all got different characters and personalities. We've done that already, okay? But you know, one of the best people at being chatty with people that I ever knew was a little lass who came up to, to university and we met her in the first term and she was amazed to find there were so many Christians in this Christian union. Because in the, in, the, in the summer before, she'd been somewhere, and there'd been a tent mission near where she lived, and this girl had really become a Christian. And she was the shyest, quietest, most, and God had worked, brought her to Christ. No question. And then she found herself in this big university. And there were these Christians. And after that, I was in a second year, I think, and after the first... Bible reading of the new term. So I stood up and gave a notice about you know street work, street evangelism. We did a lot of that in those days. And uh, probably on the team come and see me afterwards. And we should come along with this quiet, quiet little thing. I just thought, Lord, not not here. Some Zen Buddhist is going to have this girl for breakfast. You know, it's going to be a disaster. She was terrific. Week after week, this quiet little lass. I walked up to somebody in the street and week after on a Saturday and week after week on a Sunday morning she'd have two, three or four people with her in church on Sunday morning. Each in our own way. They're intentional. We're intentional about it. We mean it. We don't hold back for fear of losing friends. We show respect to people. We're not deliberately alienating. We don't wait until we land on better circumstances and we're better able to do it. We're not able to do all we want to do, but we get on and we do what we can do. And in spite of everything, we announce the good news intentionally. <coughs> not offensively, but intentionally. Whatever their troubles, whatever their persecutions, those Christians, they preach the word wherever they went. That's the first thing. And secondly, they announce the whole counsel of God, not the four spiritual laws. According to the situation of the people they were with, what they're doing is they're teaching the way of God. And they're saying, this is the way walk in it. It's not as if, it is, but then it's not. It's not as if, completely, there is one word that the unconverted need to hear, and there is one word that now you've progressed. This is the way of God for you and for me, that's walking in. We're trying to make disciples, that's what we're making disciples means. Follow me, says Jesus. Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. We're communicating and we're seeking to communicate deliberately the multifaceted message of God. Appropriate to them. Appropriate to their hearers. Appropriate to the revealed truth of God as it applied to the people they were dealing with. That's how they were all. It was the word. And each sermon or each communication, each chat was varied. And we need to apply the teaching of the whole Bible as we try and teach people the way to walk in. The way 
for the struggling father, the way for the mother with the little kids, the way for the person facing end of life issues, and the goal is to get people to walk in that whole counsel of God as they follow after Jesus in the way. It's ultimately all about finding people wherever they are and urging them to repent and believe so that now they will follow Jesus in the way. Jesus said, follow me. To a fisherman it meant one thing, to a tax collector another, to a violent political terrorist, and there were a couple of them around Jesus, it meant quite another thing, as each of them turned and trusted to follow Christ in the way. And these persecuted, scattered believers, they didn't see popularity. They weren't looking for cool Christianity. They focused on quite an uncool message. Calling for conversion. They wanted the Ethiopian eunuch to get off the chariot and get in the water. They wanted souls saved, not influenced. It was such a mistake to stop at influence. What this means for you is this. What do you think? They set about securing their goals deliberately. And they didn't hold back at the point of sale. And fourthly, and this is crucial for intentional evangelism, when we use phrases like that, we need to be aware of this. They depended on God's guidance and they saw his awesome power. If God said to you today, go down to the land of your road, down the bottom there, and you see a guy in a chariot, go and talk to him about. Oh, he's like, <laughs> I must be imagining that. I don't know if that because I feel a bit silly. Get over yourself. Because those guys did. They depended on the guidance of God and they saw his awesome power. Because actually we're not trying to persuade people of stuff. We're actually trying to draw them by the process by which God dynamically speaks to people, not just throwing ideas at them, to follow Him in the way. Philip knew nothing about the tame God gospel. Just look at what went on in Samaria when we preached there. Not afraid to pray, not afraid to act, not afraid to rely on the intervening. God who steps in when we preach Jesus to people. So they went there and preached Christ to them in Samaria. Just want to preach the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. Nothing complicated. Jesus Christ, follow him. I'm not afraid to rely on his intervening.